All right, so here we go with this. So a lot of this info we've covered in a sense. It starts to review some of the thermochem topics that we didn't really hit in much detail. We may have glanced over it with like one page of notes, but for the most part, we didn't get into detail with this. The big thing here, we talked about heat and we used Q equals MC delta T, or we talked about uh, our enthalpy as we went through phase change, but we didn't say, if I started out with a block of ice, I said, or I, again, I didn't say, uh, you know, I have an ice cube, I have this much of an ice cube, and I eventually boil it. How much energy total is required? So that's what we're going to go over today. A couple of things here is this, just some, some diagrams here. It talks about our three states of matter, and we're going to use water pretty extensively because it's easy to, to talk about, easy to deal with there. But a uh, couple of things here. As we heat something up, we have higher potential energy for the main reason, I, again, uh, those particles are moving a lot faster, the kinetic molecular theory, all those things that we talked about here. As we, again, go from solid ice here to water vapor, it's going to require energy. So again, I like to think of an ice cube. I'm putting it on a pot of, uh, or a stove or a, a pan, and I'm heating it up. Now, if we go backwards, we take liquid water, we put it in an ice tray, and we put it in the freezer, we're freezing, we're taking that energy out of that ice cube, okay? Again, phase change, we're not changing the substance, we're altering that, that energy in sense, okay? Questions on that? Next thing here, and we kind of have a similar pattern with these next few slides, is this. If we zoom in on the actual molecules, okay, when we have a solid substance, especially water, we have what type of bonds, such as it tells you? Hydrogen bonds, okay? The unique thing about hydrogen bonds, remember when they are in that solid form, they lock in place, and what's also unique with hydrogen bonds, especially water, they actually expand out, okay? As they start moving over here to the gas side, again, we're still adding that energy and we're starting to break apart those locked in hydrogen bonds, okay? So by the time we get to the gases, they're really far apart and the molecules are moving more and more. The big thing it emphasizes here, breaks those attractions as we move left to right or as we add energy into that molecule. Questions? All right, again, we look at this one more time here, uh, just zooming in on the, the water particles here. As we melt something, as we vaporize it, we're adding that energy. So think the further away those parts are, the more energy we had to add to it. But as we shrink them back together or bring them closer together, we're releasing that energy out into the environment. So questions on the basic setup here before we move to the phase change. All right, for whatever reason, I used to talk about this in thermochem, and I've gotten away from it the past couple of years, but we talked about a phase diagram. And remember, a phase diagram, I, we identified, hey, this part's the solid, this part's the liquid, this line is the phase change. Does anybody remember that? Kind of. Yeah, we talked about it probably for five or 10 minutes. This right here is showing our specific heat, AKA energy that we're using as we go through a phase change. So again, we're gonna use water as we get our ice cube and we end up as water vapor here. A unique thing here, and this is something that's, that's probably the most important, is that as we move from left to right, we're always adding energy. However, check this out. From this flat line and this flat line, we're adding energy. That's what this says. We're adding heat, aka energy. 
but we're not increasing temperature. So a really key point here is this. As we go through a phase change, as we go a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, during that phase change, the temperature is not going to change, okay? As we're in one state of matter, like here, it's all solid, there is going to be a temperature change as we go through that process of adding heat. The big point of this is during these diagonal lines, we can use that formula Q equals MC delta T because the, the change in temperature is actually changing. Flat lines, we're gonna have to use a little bit different formula, okay? Overall, the total amount of energy we need to add those together, which we'll get to in our example. Questions? All right. So uh, we go through a couple of these, these graphs just to uh, emphasize this. Um, again, the major thing, flat lines here, we do not have any change of temperature, but we're still increasing our energy. The other thing that this uh, emphasizes here is this. It says we have a change of kinetic energy, right? As we add temperature, we're starting to get uh, those particles to move faster. In the, the actual phase change, it says uh, breaking and or forming attractions, just depending if you're heating or cooling. What we're doing we're, in water we're breaking apart those hydrogen bonds and or we're putting them back together or going backwards, all right? Questions? All right. Then here we go on this part here. So diagonal lines, you get temperature change and energy change. Q equals MC delta T because there's a temperature change. On our flat lines, we have to have something different because we have no temperature change. If we had delta T, it'd be zero, and that would cancel out all that energy. So we have to think about that a little bit differently. And so here is our delta H of fusion, delta H of vaporization, and we can get our Q value here. The only problem is this stuff requires quite a bit of energy, so they put it in kilojoules. The diagonal line stuff, we put it in joules. Okay, questions on this before we go to an example. Okay. Um, oh, so I wish they would have put this in a little bit different format, but that's okay. Uh, delta H of vaporization is a lot more energy than delta H of our fusion. Okay, so melting's more than our vaporization. Anybody explain why just through pieces or molecules? Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna roll with that a little bit. When we're a solid, or oh, go ahead. I was gonna say bonds are closer to solids than they are. There it is, right? And a solid, right? We're locked in place. Then a liquid, we get a little bit more breathing room. Not much more, though. Going from a liquid to a gas, now we got to go a pretty close to really far away, right? It's like separating a fight. If you get in there initially, not much energy, but then to really separate those people fighting, you got to you got to yank them and pull them away. Okay. Um, good. Any other questions here? All right, so a couple of things before we get into our actual problems, all right? Heat's required to go from that melting into the vaporization. Backwards process here, heat's released when we freeze or condensate. Basic phase change, which we've talked about. We really haven't talked about the specific type of, okay? Our other things is this. Um, oh, yes. Delta H of vaporization is bigger for the reasons we just talked about. 
what we can also talk about is this. Our uh, delta H of freezing and our delta H of condensation, they're the same values. We just reverse the sign. That's what these bottom two points are saying. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right. Let's actually do an example because that would be better for us. We want to know, using this chart, uh, we have gallium, and it said it can be purified by melting. We want to know how much energy in kilojoules is required to melt two moles of gallium uh, originally at 293 Kelvin. Okay, so uh, first off here is this. Let's build a picture, and let's build a picture just to the right of our chart. And let's have that same exact chart that we used or we saw throughout these notes. So from left to right, we're going to be increasing our heat, AKA our energy. And then from top to bottom, from top to bottom, we're going to be increasing our temperature. Okay, so our uh, temp is increasing as we move from here. Now, we are worried about this melting business. Gallium melts at 303 Kelvin, and right now, at the very start of this, we're at 293 Kelvin. So are we originally at a solid, or are we already at a liquid at 293 Kelvin? Solid. So what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna start with this, just to build us a picture. Now, this temperature is gonna keep increasing, increasing, increasing until we reach that melting point of 303 Kelvin. So if you wanna mentally note this part right here, this would be 303 Kelvin. And at that point, that's when the solid gallium would start to melt. So we would end up with our flat line there. So we're still increasing our energy, but we're not increasing our temperature, okay? Now, we keep melting this until everything melts, okay? So I'm gonna draw this next diagonal line, and I'm also going to, yeah, let's circle this. Circle this point right here, because now the point that I circled, everything's a liquid, and the temperature is increasing. We're only concerned about, we are only uh, concerned about our um, melting portion, okay? It would keep heating up as you add more and more energy or as you add more and more heat, but our concern is this. We want to get it to that melting point. We want to melt everything, but then we don't want to heat it up. Does everyone understand that, that process there? Okay, so the first part that we need to do is this. We need to worry about our temperature increase, which what formula are we gonna use for the temp increase? Okay, so step one is going to use Q, Q equals M C delta T. Cool. All right now, M for mass has to be in grams. We are given two moles of gallium. So if we have two moles of gallium, how do we convert that to grams? Molar mass, which for time's sake, let me just give you that particular molar mass here of gallium. Um, Oh, I didn't read my units. Under standard, what I gave you in notes, I always use mass. However, again, I didn't read this right here. It gives it to you per mole. Okay. What we have to do, okay, 
we can go ahead because we are given it in joules per mole instead of joules and in, in our notes I gave it to you in joules per gram, we can go ahead and plug in those two moles. So just ignore this, bless you, uh, as we go through this process. So for step one, what we can do is this. We can say Q equals R, uh, M, which for our case will be two moles of gallium. So we have two moles of gallium times our C. Our C, our heat capacity, is going to be 25.86 joules per mole Kelvin. And then our delta T. Our delta T, I want you to think about this. If we started at 293, we're going to end at what temperature? What did you say? We'll be right at 303. At that point, that's when we're going to start melting. So we're getting up to that melting temperature. So we're going to multiply this, this stuff right here, uh, by our temperature change, which we ended at 303. We started at 293, so what's our change or our delta? Or 10, all right? So we'll say times 10 big K Kelvin, okay? So we'll get our calculators and go through this. We have 2 times 25.86 times 10, and I get 517.2 joules, okay? All right, now, again, all we've done is we've increased the temperature to the melting point. The next point here is that we need to take and we need to find our energy to melt all of the solid into our particular liquid, all right? No temp change, all right? So our formula on this, our step two, is going to be this. Step two, we're still going to find Q for heat or energy there, okay? But we're going to take our delta H of, well, this is a good question, which one would we use, fusion or vaporization? What, which one's melting? Fusion is melting, okay? So we're going to use Q equals delta H I'll abbreviate this as, as fusion times delta H of fusion uh, times our number of moles because this is given as kilojoules per mole. Okay, so I'll put hashtag moles there. And so uh, let's go through this here. So our Q equals delta H of fusion, which is 5.59 kilojoules per mole, times our number of moles, which is still two. And if we throw this in, 5.59 times two, we get 11.18 kilojoules and here's our last part to figure out our total amount of energy we would add these two things together now what's the problem with our green number it's not in joules now on the, the, the short response they don't care if you put it in kilojoules or you put it in joules as long as it's the same unit all right, I'm going to put it in kilojoules just because it's a lot nicer unit. So I'm going to take 517 divided by 1,000, 0.5172 plus 11.18, and I get a value, let's see, by the time I round to actually three sig figs of 11.7 kilojoules, okay? So that would be ultimately our final answer. All right, questions.
Now, let's let, let's just think about this for a second too. If I'm if I had liquid water or gallium and I wanted to freeze it, I'm still going to use this number, but what would I do at the sign? Make it negative. It's releasing away from gallium into the, the outside world there. Questions? Anybody need this? The next ones are multiple choice, so we don't spend a whole lot of time here. All right. Wonderful. All right. Same uh, concept here. It says use the principles of bonding. Let's just talk about it to explain why the heat of vaporization is much greater than the heat of fusion. Who, who, uh, Carson, what did you say about about that earlier? They're, they're closer together, so it's easier to push them just a little ways, but now going from a liquid to a gas, you got to really push them away. So it's because you're going to have to have a greater extent or a, a, a more um, energy used to separate them. Okay, and I have the exact textbook definition here for this uh, response. But any questions? Those two answers combined, I know we spent like 10 minutes on it because I was trying to explain some things, would probably be a short free response. Okay, so it'd be, hey, throw the calculation in, do a little explanation, short free response. Okay, again, we spent... 10, 15 minutes on it because it was a new, new topic, new concept. Uh, but they would go a little bit quicker. All right. So, um, and this one here, it says uh, we use the uh, plastic here, polyethylene tura phthalate, or PDT. It's in water bottles. Okay. Uh, it involves the crystallization of melted PET while the plastic is solidifying the net flow of thermal plastic energy uh, to the surroundings or from the surroundings um, to the plastic. Oh, that's the question. Is the net flow of thermal energy as it's crystallizing, so it's becoming a solid, is it going into the plastic, or is the plastic releasing that energy? If it's becoming a solid. It's releasing the energy, and our justification on that would be, well, our bonds or our substance is getting closer and closer together. As they form those attractions, they are releasing the energy. So forming the attractions gives off that energy, okay? Part B, I do want to go over this calculation here. It says determine the amount of heat in kilojoules involved when solidifying 12 moles of PET uh, to its melting point, and we're given the delta H of fusion of 26 kilojoules per mole. Uh, include the correct sign, important here. We are giving off energy, so what has to happen to the sign? Negative, all right? So when we plug this into our equation, we're going to throw a negative in there, and all we're going to have to do to find our amount of energy is take our delta H of fusion, or I guess it would be freezing technically, times our number of moles, and so all we would have to do is say Q equals negative 26.0 kilojoules per mole times our 12 moles that we have there. And if we did that there, 26 times 12 would get us negative 312 kilojoules. So again, negative 312 kilojoules of heat would be released as the plastic goes from that liquid to that solid form. Questions? One question, why do I only have one step in this process here compared to the last problem that had two steps? We're just going through that phase change, yes. Okay. Next part goes a little bit faster if there are multiple choice questions. 
any but you need this. Cool. All right. So the other thing, and I used to teach this and I took it out a couple of years ago, is bond enthalpies. Well, guess what? When we have chemical bonds either break or form, we're either going to release or we're going to um, gain that energy here. Okay? So remember the whole concept of a chemical reaction. We have the reactants. They're reacting. They're hitting each other. We could talk about kinetics and things like that. But chemical bonds have to break. Atoms rearrange. And then new chemical bonds form to form those products. This is talking about the energy with that, that portion here. Questions? All right. So um, bond energy is saying, hey, Again, there is potential energy in that chemical bond, all right? So a hydrogen bond here, hydrogen, hydrogen bond. If we broke it, right, imagine snapping a stick, that snapping that pencil that was on that first picture. If you're giving off that energy or you're breaking those pieces out into the world, you're releasing 436 kilojoules. If you put those bonds back together, it's going to require that much energy, okay? With our examples here, we have our chart. Again, given in kilojoules per mole. And I want you to notice right here in the middle, from the carbon single bond all the way to the carbon triple bond, our number keeps increasing. So the more bonds you have between atoms, the stronger or more energy it takes to snap them or put them back together, which makes sense, right? Because Triple bonds are much, much closer together than single bonds. There's also more electrons that are being shared in that. Questions? All right. Now, here is one thing I don't necessarily like, and I'll, I'll throw up a, a, my formula that I like here. We've seen this. Uh, remember, fancy E symbol, epsilon, means add up all of the products and reactants. This has bonds broken plus the number of bonds formed. Now, the problem with this is they say, hey, it has to be negative. In thermochemistry, I said, you're going to be leaps and bounds ahead if you do what minus what? There it is, products minus reactants. So I like to say this, our delta X or our delta H of our reaction is this. Our epsilon of our, uh, of our bonds in our product side, so I'll say our, yeah, let's do product bonds. Minus all of those bonds added together with our reactants or our reactant bonds, okay? Products minus reactants. If you do that, there's no need to worry about flipping or changing the sign because we flip or change that sign with that minus sign in there, okay? I like using that because then it keeps me kind of like one track of, okay, I get to thermochem, products minus reactants. That's what I'm gonna use. You could use this and get to the same answer. I like products minus reactants, so. Okay, questions? All right, so let's try an example here, all right? We have methane plus oxygen uh, produces carbon dioxide and water, all right? Now, what we want to do is this, and they actually break it down really nicely for us in this example. It says here, in our methane, there are four CH bonds. So if we looked at this, we would say, okay, right here, that's one CH bond. Then we have another, our third, and our fourth, okay? We have to account for every single bond in this process, all right? Now, let's plug this into our formula and see what happens. So we wanna know the delta H of the reaction, and we're gonna start out with what first, our 
products or our reactants? Products, all right? So I'm gonna go over here. In this side, in our carbon dioxide, we have two carbon oxygen bonds that are double bonded. So what I'm going to do is this, and some of you may remember brackets. I'm gonna say I have two bonds times, and technically that would be two moles, two moles times, if I go down to C double bond O, 799 kilojoules per mole. Close the parentheses, I still have some stuff over here, and that is my H2O. Now, why do I have four OH bonds? Because water, H2O, in every single H2O, you're gonna have two OH bonds. Well, balancing says we have two H2Os, so two times two, that's why we get that four there. But we have, nonetheless, four moles of OH bonds times our value here of 464 kilojoules per mole, okay? Now, again, that stuff right there is our reactants. So I like to bracket it, put it all together. Then I like to say minus, go back to my products, I have four CH bonds, so I say four moles of my CH bonds times 414 kilojoules per mole, okay? Close it, I still have some stuff, I have two of those double bond oxygens because of the two coefficient there. And so I put two times 498 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so let's go ahead, let's get a number here and then we'll be done with this part of the problem here. So two times 799, plus four times 464, I say minus four times 414 plus R2 times 498, close those parentheses, and I end up with 802 kilojoules per mole, or excuse me, just kilojoules. Okay, questions? Anybody need this? All right, let's go fast through the remaining part here. And we get our two examples. It says, based on the bond energies below, which table best represents the diagram? Uh, cool hydrogen and chlorine react to give us hydrochloric or hydrogen chloride gas. And we have our bond energy. Okay, so if we just think about this, um, and we want to think about the change in energy, we're breaking apart a hydrogen and we're breaking apart a chlorine, right? We're releasing these energies. If we just think about that, I like to say, okay, if this is negative and this is negative, then when we reform the bonds, this has to be positive. So overall, would we get a negative number or a positive number? What is it? Negative. So does our products have to be higher or lower than our reactants in our chart? Lower, because it releases, it gives off energy, okay? So right away, these bottom two, C and D, they're eliminated, they're gone. Okay. Now it's saying, okay, well, what is my change in energy, okay? Well, if we did 430 plus 240, that's what, 670? So negative 670 plus 430 is how much, approximately? Negative 240. So our answer has to be B because we're releasing energy 
and we're releasing about 240 kilojoules of heat. Does that make sense? All right, uh, last part here is this. Um, decomposition of hydrogen peroxide represented through this. Delta H is negative. It wants us to identify, based on that, what is our overall bonds in each of these substances, okay? So if we are releasing a lot of energy to give us a negative sign, our negative sign, uh, or our H2O2, does it have to be more or less than all this other stuff? It has to be more, all right? And so we look here in our chart, and in our H2O2, what value is going to give us a lot more on our left-hand side? C, 500 is going to be multiplied by 2, number 1, and it's going to be a lot greater than this stuff there, all right? That makes sense. And then our last thing here is this. Um, breaking a bond is going to require energy. Releasing bond happens when it forms. And so, uh, again, I don't necessarily like this part here, but products minus reactants is much better. Questions? All right. So... We will get the second part of day six notes, and then we'll be done. Anybody have any questions?